I said this is going to be our open forum session where Danny Douglas will be up here on the hot seat this afternoon. We do have several questions that we can get to, but we do want to go ahead and turn the other one off. We do want to have it available where others are able to answer and ask questions as well uh, to give additional information or to even disagree in some areas always holding the Bible as our standard. But if you're going to talk, come up to the podium over here and state your name and where you're from. There's always the tendency of some to start trying to talk from where you're sitting and don't make me get on to you about that again. <laughs> Please come up so that uh, it will be on the tape and everyone will be able to hear you. Uh, that way it will facilitate the, those comments to where everyone is able to profit from them. Again, this is a question and answer period. It is a way to study the Bible. We are not trying to, as a many synods try to do to set policy for anyone. We are just trying to come to a greater understanding of God's Word. We're just using the questions as a avenue through which to study. And that's what this should be considered as and only as that aspect. We are set to study God's Word and try to come to a harmonious conclusion in relationship to the questions and learn more about them. God's word from him. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brother Douglas. Thank you, Brother Michael, for this opportunity. Uh, I never have done this before, but certainly I've had about an hour to look forward to it. You can always uh, just imitate someone else. That's <laughs> yeah, I always imagine Brother Guy in Woods, he... Uh, was excellent doing the open forum at Free Hardman many years ago. Did a great job with that. But I do want to say this before I get into the questions that we not only allow, but we welcome and encourage brethren to come up and make comments on any of these. And certainly I would appreciate it if you see anything that I've said that's lacking or if you just feel like that you can contribute something in addition to this that I did not say or compliment something that I've said, that is, it goes along with what I've said, I certainly would encourage you to do that. The first question, when Samson prayed for God to give him strength to kill himself along with the Philistines, was this God-assisted suicide? Now, that's a pertinent question because we're going to be hearing a lot more about euthanasia. But in the first place, let me say that no, God did not condone suicide in any form. He never has. We can't find authority for that in the Bible. But we do find in Judges chapter 16 in the house of Dagon where the Philistines were making sport of Samson the strong man. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And then down in verse 30, And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all his might. And the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein, so that, so that the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. Let us remember that Samson had many things about him that were not commendable. But Samson was used by God to defeat God's enemies and the enemies of God's people. And that was the purpose of this incident here and this death. It was in the defeat of God's enemies. And if I understand this request, of Samson, it was not so much as an intent to commit suicide, 
but for the purpose of defeating the enemies of the Lord. And God gave him strength to do that, to bring the house down, as it were, and literally so, upon the Philistines, and thus killing more in his death than he did in his life. Now, does anyone else have a comment or a question about that? You'd like to come up here, and Brother Brown? David Brown, Spring, Texas. Uh, if it is the case that Samson receiving strength from God to carry out God's will that involved his death is suicide, then it's the case that our Lord committed suicide. Because he said, nobody takes my life. I lay it down. In other words, he had every opportunity to deliver himself. Thus it was in the will of God that he die and that he gave himself to die. It's true that the people took his life, but did that have to be? No. Everything, he said, to this end was I born. To die. Granted, they, they took his life, but his will was to die. It was involved that he die, and he willed himself to die, and he does it on the cross. After he spent six hours there, he makes it very clear. It is finished. In Father, into thy hand, I commend my spirit, and he willed himself to die. Now, if that's not what he did, I'd like to know what he did. And we ought to also remember this. He who gives life, human life, it's his will that governs that life. And if God's will is that a man like Samson is to destroy him in his death, then that's as much right as go marry ye a daughter of whoredom. Would you tell your child to do that today? And yet it was right because God said it was right. God makes that right. He's going to destroy everybody someday. And His will being done made the difference. There's the situation. Samson was acting on the will of God that he give his life to destroy these people. God is in that position to tell us to do that. If God told me today, I'm not going to do it, but He told me today to... Uh, uh, destroy somebody and in the process you're going to lose your life would I be obligated to do it oh no Lord you're trying to get me to commit suicide no would and uh, I think that's a thing to keep in mind too about the Lord's will was being done here and he was acting under authority of God and that's uh, something that we sometimes make you forget about thank you brother Brown excellent comment does anyone else have anything all right number two would you please explain what imputed righteousness is all about? In Genesis 15 and verse 16, uh, verse 6 rather, regarding Abram, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. And then in the fourth chapter of Romans, verse number 3, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Then over in James, the second chapter, verses 21 to 23, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. It's interesting and noteworthy, from my understanding, that this statement would be made not only in the context of faith in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, but also obedient works in James chapter 2, indicating the fact that the faith that causes one to, be, to have righteousness imputed to him, that is, to be accounted righteous before God, does not come by faith only or faith alone. The question here that I believe we need to be considering is when was Abraham accounted as righteous? It was when his faith prompted him to obey the will of God, which it did. In Genesis chapter 22, in this example of James, in offering up his son Isaac. And so to be, to have righteousness imputed is to have a living, obedient faith walk with God in doing His will, then one is counted as righteous before God. Does anyone have any 
But for the comments, Brother Doug. I already introduced him, didn't I? Doug Flesh in Texas. Uh, you just outlined what the Bible teaches about the imputed righteousness. But the Calvinistic uh, and Wesleyan concept of it is that the personal righteousness of our Lord is transferred to the sinner. That's what they mean by imputed righteousness. It has not to do with one's own obedience in response to the gospel, not in Calvinist system, but that uh, there is uh, what must be termed a miraculous transference of Jesus' own perfect righteousness to the sinner. And so that's the imputed righteousness that we must uh, deny and uh, we must refute and reprove. But uh, the Bible does teach imputed righteousness. Yes. Thank you, Brother Dove. I appreciate that. Uh, in regard to what Brother McClish said here, regarding Calvinism and other things, they teach that it's transferred at the point of faith only and not obedient faith. But again, in James 2, James answers that fallacy. Even so, faith that hath not worked is dead, being alone. James 2.17 Okay, uh, Brother Lee? Kind of long, uh, Lee Moses, uh, man of Spring, Arkansas, and kind of complimenting what uh, Brother Dub said. Uh, the idea of the imputed righteousness kind of has the idea that uh, we are born depraved, and so we can do nothing righteous, and so uh, we are viewed as righteous as Christ was. And uh, right along with that goes uh, the uh, sin that is supposedly imputed from us to Christ. That Christ supposedly upon the cross was viewed as uh, blackened with sin uh, himself. So the imputation uh, kind of goes both ways in that Calvinistic scheme. Yes, thank you, Brother Moses. In regard to what he said, we know that uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 teaches us that the sacrifice of Christ was for the purpose of making us righteous. So we know that we cannot really truly be righteous, that is justified in the sight of God without Christ. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Second Corinthians 5.21 Thank you. Uh, the third question is... Danny. Uh, I'm sorry, did I... Brother Brown? David Brown, Spring, Texas. This uh, gives an opportunity to make a comment about some of the uh, song, one of the songs in our songbook, uh, which is one we sung all along, uh, 438 in this songbook, number 438, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. And uh, I'm quite sure, though I don't know who William Bradbury back in 1863 was, or Edward Moat, 1834, um, but I don't doubt that they had in mind when they wrote this the Calvinistic view of imputed righteousness as well explained by Brother Dove and commented on by Brother Moses because it says here my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness um, and so on it goes through this and then some people have asked because, well then can we sing that song well that all depends upon your own enlightenment on the basis of the right divided word of God concerning what you explain. Because the gospel does come from Jesus Christ. The New Testament is his last one in the Testament. So there is a way that you can sing this very well and it's perfectly scriptural. And that is when you because none of our songs are worth anything if you don't understand what the Bible teaches uh, that's covered in the song. So when you sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, uh, if you think if you're thinking Calvinistically, then you're going to think about what was said earlier. But if you've been enlightened by the right and divided word concerning our righteousness, as it's taught in the Scriptures, uh, how is it Jesus reckoned righteousness to us as He does to Abraham through our faithful obedience to the gospel, then I mean, this what these folks thought. Yes, and it's marked out here, and that's the reason, one reason I'm going to deal with it. Uh, when he shall come and trump and say, Oh man, then he'll be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless, stand before the throne. I don't doubt that's 
Uh, and it's up to the elders they don't want to sing it. That's their business as far as that's concerned. I'm just trying to tell you that there is a way you can sing it and it be right. Because the Bible does talk about imputed righteousness, doesn't it? Isn't that in your Bible? Does the Bible say that? No. Did you explain it according to the truth? Can you sing this song with that in mind? Yes? Are we going to fight? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good wait. How, how would you explain dressing his righteousness alone in the sense that it alone excludes everything else? And I'm Michael Hatcher from uh, Pennsylvania. The fellow we wanted to get behind the screen a while ago. Uh, in his righteousness alone, are you not contending for the faith, the system of salvation? Are you not contending for the whole New Testament system alone? The entirety of the New Testament system, yes, which includes our righteousness as well. Well, yes, that's true. We <laughs> our righteousness as well, but righteousness, we are righteous on the basis of what? Upon the basis of God's Word, obviously. Where did God's Word but, come from? But we have to be righteous, and this excludes our righteousness when it says rest in His righteousness alone. If, if, you you mind, if you understand Calvinistic concept, but I want to know is the New Testament His righteousness? Well, certainly. Well, the righteousness I, of God is revealed embrace, in the gospel. If I embrace His righteousness and do what in His righteousness He requires me to do, am I not righteous even as He is righteous? That sounds like John talking to me. John 3 87. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm, trying to, first say, John I'm trying to say personally that I think you have to be careful on some of these. I, I agree. I think, yeah. do, you, do you sing Amazing Grace? Uh, I changed one of the words in Amazing Grace also. <laughs> but I'm saying that more than likely that person amazes, that wrote Amazing Grace, I yeah. doubt he had in mind the truth that we heard Doug preach last night on I, Grace. But when you're educated yeah. according to the Bible, you can. Now, it's up to elders as to whether yeah. they think that ought to be uh, taken out and so forth. And I certainly, if that's what they think, that seems to be fine. But I am trying to say yeah. that there's a danger sometimes on song. Because the nature of songs how they're written, and it's up to us to enlighten ourselves according to the Bible, and then see these songs in the light of the Bible, if such is possible. I agree, and some sense. some individuals do certainly go overboard in looking for errors within songs, yeah, they do. and some individuals go the opposite extreme and don't find anything wrong in songs where they are wrong. <laughs> but I think you can see, I hope between us, that you've seen how there needs to be uh, some balance, and I don't mind yeah. that word, where it needs to be, so. and proper examination on things because there is poetic license. But I don't doubt this guy wrote that song with mm. Calvinistic and computed rights in mind. Uh, so, uh, let's see, so I guess we can sing... Uh, Jesus is coming soon. <laughs> and we can. Appreciate the comments. Uh, question number three is, Mark 5 speaks of unclean spirits being cast out of a man and into a herd of swine. I have heard it taught that the unclean spirits were actually the spirits of dead men, or dead lost men, rather. I still don't understand the concept because the Bible teaches that it is appointed to man once to die, and then the judgment. Also, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus teaches that the dead cannot be sent back to earth. Can you please expound on who the unclean spirits were? Well, I think these comments here, there's a lot of things said right here. For one thing, the uh, questioner says that story of the rich man Lazarus was a parable. Uh, in Luke 16, in verse 19, where the story begins, Luke says, now there was a certain rich man. Brother Guy and Woods used to say, now was there? Was there? There was. There was a certain rich man. And hence, we do not consider it to be a parable. However, whether we consider it to be a parable or not, it teaches inspired truth. Now, in regard to Mark chapter 5, casting out the unclean spirits, we find in Mark chapter 5, But when he, that is the demon-possessed man, saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, 
and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. Now, this is a good example of the truth that James taught in James 2.19, that the demons also believe and tremble. They trembled when they saw Jesus. Now, as we further read, and he saw him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. We read in the next verse. We do understand the demon-possessed people to be possessed with the spirits uh, that is, they were possessed with the spirits of wicked men departed who had gone into eternity. They went into the Hadean realm after their death, into the place of torments like the rich man in Luke 16. Uh, they were allowed to come back to earth during this time period, during the time of demon possession, during the miraculous age. And we see that one reason God allowed this was to show the power of Christ over Satan in the spirit world. For Christ was able to cast out demons as well as the apostles through His name, and thus showing the Lord's power over the spirit world. We know that He exhibited His power over the natural world and common the seas, turning the water to wine and doing various and sundry other things. Now, as to this comment about Luke 16, we do have accounts of the Bible where men did come back from the dead. For example, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. But does that mean that Lazarus did not die a second time? We know that he did. And will Lazarus face God in the judgment? Indeed he will. It's true it is upon none the man wants to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 The raising of the dead and these unclean spirits coming back to earth for a time until the end of the miraculous age and the completion of the New Testament does not mean, uh, this does not mean that uh, these demon-possessed people were not inhabited by the departed spirits of wicked men. I'd like to turn over to Luke 16, though. And to read to what the querist has, the, the questioner has reference to. Uh, this is the answer that Father Abraham gave to the beggar. The, or rather to the rich man. He did become a beggar, didn't he? He started begging for a drop of water to cool his tongue. Of course, the beggar on this earth, Lazarus, this earth, Lazarus had already gone into paradise. But the rich man who is now departed into the Hadean realm, the place of torments. Then he said, verse 27, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him, that is, Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. You know, people today that say they have to see a miracle before they believe, they need to read this. If they want to hear the Word of God, they're not going to believe in a miracle. The Scriptures are all sufficient. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, freely furnished, unto all good works. We have what we need. And the rich man's five brethren had Moses and the prophets. They had the Word of God. They had sufficient to produce faith and repentance and obedience in their lives. And it was in this context that Lazarus was not allowed to come back to earth and warn his five brethren. It was in the context of the fact that the Word of God is all sufficient. And that's what they needed then, and that's what we need today. Now, does anybody have a comment or a question about 
anything that we've said here on this matter. A scripture here, uh, Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 2. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And I also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. So when the prophets pass out of the land, so will the unclean spirits. After the cessation of miracles and the completion of the New Testament, then there would be no more demon possession or occasion to cast out unclean spirits. Does anyone have any comments or questions on this one? Brother Michael? Maybe not specifically in relationship to this. I'm Michael Hatcher from Pensacola. Uh, in Matthew 27, uh, since it's mentioned about death and uh, wants to die, maybe uh, make some comments on verse 52 and 53 where the graves were opened and many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and, and appeared unto many uh, in relationship to that. Uh, what was discussed in the question about uh, want, being wants to die and, and that aspect. Yeah. Of course, uh, these who came back that Brother Michael read to us about a moment ago, these also would die again. There's only been one person who's been raised to die no more, and that's Jesus Christ. I am he that liveth. Revelation chapter 1, the Lord said, He was dead, but he is alive forevermore. And one day we will be raised with him. He is the first fruits of them that slept, according to 1 Corinthians 15. And because of Christ's resurrection, that's the guarantee and the surety that we also will be raised. Brother Skip. I'm Skip Francis from Liberal, Kansas. I wanted to touch just a minute on this subject of demons. There seems to be a tendency today to go to one extreme or the other when it comes to matters like these in the Bible. People either try to put them into the physical realm by suggesting that, they're, that these weren't demons, that they were diseases like epilepsy and things of that nature, or they try to really go the other direction and try to uh, come up with answers like that, making them into ghosts and things of that nature. We need to understand that the Bible calls them demons. So they're demons. They're not epilepsy. They're not humans come back to earth. But, but there's a good reason why we don't see these kinds of things today. And, and we see this in Mark, uh, in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 3. After Jesus had just completed casting out devils, the... The scribes came and they accused him of casting out devils in the name of Beelzebub, basically. And what his answer is, how can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand, but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, then he will spoil his house. Now this is an indication to us that just as in these day, this day and age the miraculous is no longer with us, but also the demons, Satan would not have the power he had back then, today, he's bound. And by the way, I might also add to the premillennialists, we also see that in, in Revelation chapter 20. Thank, thank you, Brother Francis. Good comment. David Brown, Spring, Texas. Jesus said to certain Jews, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Who did he say that to? Human beings. Because they were not disposed to follow the Lord's will, Thus to believe a lie, they became the servants of Satan. Now when they die, they die contaminated by sin. Thus you have over in uh, Zechariah, them not the demons called unclean spirits. Unclean in what sense? Unclean in their contaminated with sin. And thus a man can die and be an unclean spirit. 
one, uh, they have to be somebody, I mean, they have to be some being, and uh, when they come back to earth, they like bodies. They like to be in a body. When the demons that were legion, they cried out to Jesus, so they recognized who he was more than the Jews could or would, and hast thou come to torment us before the time? Because they knew the way they had lived, they were subject to condemnation on the day of judgment. Why do they want a body? Because some people say, well, those demons must be uh, angels. But the, the normal way that angels uh, exist is not on a physical plane in the sense of material bodies. But these beings want a body. Human beings were made for bodies. Human beings want a body. Paul even calls the time between the resurrection and one's death, the time when we're naked. Meaning that we don't have a resurrected body. So what I'm trying to say is, the most logical conclusion is these were men who died sinners, servants of Satan. Because you're not any better off to say that, well, you can sign them to a place and they can't come out of it. Well, they're exceptions, brethren. And he who makes the rule can make the exception. And I think you've got the exception for the reason Brother Danny said. These unclean spirits, these demons came out of the Hadean world by God's permission. For what reason? For Christ to show authority in all things and over all things. So I said, what if they're they bad angels? But it is said by Jude and Peter in verse 6 of Jude, the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting chains unto darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So they're just as bound routinely in a certain place and they can't get loose as the rich man was in the Hadean world and Tartarus. But something is an unclean spirit or a demon that is a person uh, that possesses somebody else and when they're in somebody else's body they're controlling that other person's own being. So you don't have much more a way to arrive at things than to say we have the preponderance of the evidence taking in all the Bible has to say on it in its proper context, then what do we do? We can't, we, we don't have the evidence saying that these are beings that never had a body. Uh, these folks, these unclean spirits love bodies. They love them so much that when they know the Lord's going to cast them out, what do they ask to have happen? Cast into a bunch of hogs. Well, that really accomplished a lot for them, didn't it? Drove the hogs crazy and ran them into the sea and then what? They're still out of a body. These unclean spirits, these demons like bodies. Now who is it that's ever been created that had a body and was meant to have a body and will be resurrected for those who die faithful in a glorified body? And if it's not unclean, unclean spirits of men who made themselves unclean on this earth because they were of their father the devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and so on. Now, I don't think he used to fall out over it, but I'm simply saying that seems to be the preponderance of the biblical evidence as to who, if we're going to identify these unclean spirits, as best we've got going for us. And in this transition period, this infant stage of the church, this time in which the New Testament is being revealed, confirmed by miracle signs and wonders, then these things are happening. Because not only did Christ show His power over them, but the ambassadors of the court of heaven, the apostles, also by the baptismal measure of power in the Holy Spirit, showed their power over them. Thank you. Brother Brown is very informative. Next question is, I often hear Christians speak of being proud of this or that accomplishment or of their children or of their country or government. Is there any place, biblically speaking, for pride of any kind under any circumstance or is it always a vice and not a virtue? I know sometimes people might say, for example, to a son, make your parents proud of you. And all they're simply saying is, honor your parents by what you go out and do in this life. Bring honor to them. Now, some others may have some comments on this. I don't understand this to necessarily be sinful pride, pride, or being prideful. We do know that haughtiness and the vainglory of life, that is sinful. Pride go up before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16, verse 18. But I do not understand to say that you're proud of someone or something of this nature 
to necessarily refer to haughtiness or evil pride. A lot of times I refrain from using that expression so that a person would not get the wrong idea, but I wouldn't necessarily say a person would be in error for using that. Does anyone have any comment on that or disagreement? Okay. I think there is a proper use of pride and an improper use of pride. It is pride from the standpoint that when we get up in the mornings, we clean up. And women uh, put all their uh, the engine paint on. <laughs> and men comb their hairs if they have any or shave or brush their one tooth you know. uh, that is a result of pride pride in their appearance uh, there's nothing wrong with that uh, it is a good and healthy aspect in the aspect of pride that is sinful, you're dealing with an arrogance or haughtiness, as you put it, the term you used, uh, in relationship to others, trying to place yourself above other individuals, and a vain glory of life. Uh, the aspect of vain there has to be considered. Uh, I know that King James uses pride, but it, uh, vain glory, as American Standard puts it. Uh, there's a glory that an individual has that is worthless, it is of no value. While there is some aspects of pride that are valuable and necessary for just us doing what we would rightfully do. So I think both aspects need to be understood in relationship to that. Thank you, Brother Michael. So there's a difference between self-respect and dignity and arrogance. Thank you. The next question, since all Christians are priests and the only priests and have the right and obligation to offer up sacrifices of praise and worship, and since Christians are the only ones to which the Lord's Supper is truly for and the benefits thereof, then is it a mistake, even sinful, to invite non-Christians to our assemblies to participate in such, and is it wrong to use our assemblies as an evangelistic tool? Uh, in 1 Peter 2, in verse number 5, here the Scripture speaks of Christians, the church, as a holy priesthood. He also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 2, 9, the church is referred to as a royal priesthood. But now in answer to the question, I do not know of any congregation or any brethren that are inviting non-Christians to come and take the Lord's Supper and worship. But we do invite them to come and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is correct to understand that only Christians are those who are in communion with Christ and fellowship with Him. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of Christ. But I do not understand it to be sinful or erroneous to invite non-Christians to our assemblies to meet Christians and to hear the Word of God preached. Alright? And we've got about five minutes. There are some who are now teaching that our worship assemblies are only for Christians and it would be sinful to allow non-Christian to even attend the worship service. Uh, that is starting to be advocated by some individuals now uh, and they base it upon this that it is all Christian, only Christians are priests and thus to have them involved in any aspect of that worship to God would be thus sinful. Um, so you want to comment about that? 
Well, um, yes, I'm turning. Can I say something? Yes, sir, Brother Chairman. Ken Chumley from Belvedere, South Carolina. Uh, Michael, this is not a new concept. Uh, I know that from personal experience when I was back in Australia. And I know this was also true in the older congregations in England. They would have their morning assembly, which was for the brethren, and the brethren only. Then their evening meeting was the gospel meeting, in which they would invite those who are not Christians to hear the gospel. In the morning assembly, the Lord's Supper would be offered. In the evening assembly, it would not be offered to anyone that was there. And it goes back to this very idea of those who are not Christians cannot partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, which I referred to yesterday in my lesson, yesterday afternoon, that if a non-Christian partakes of the bread and the fruit of the vine, he is not communion, he's taking a piece of bread and drinking the fruit of the vine. He's just bread and fruit of the vine. He cannot commune because he's not in a right relationship with God to therefore commune. And this is what has happened. What happened is brethren went to the point they wanted to be sure that non-brethren would not be there to commune, to, to, to commune. And so basically the morning service was always a private service. The evening meeting was a public assembly. So, all I'm saying with what Michael had to say is not new, it's been around for at least uh, a century, a century and a half, probably. You Thank you, Brother Ken, for that history there. Maybe I should have used the word reviving this doctrine. That might have been a more accurate <laughs> term. First Corinthians 14, verse 23 indicates that unbelievers did come in when the church was gathered together. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and I'll speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? That is, in the context of what the Corinthians were doing, which Paul was trying to correct, they would look mad to visitors coming into the assembly. So that indicates there's nothing unscriptural there for an unbeliever to come in among believers. Well, I believe that's all our time, Brother Michael. Thank you.